I want to welcome you to this Okra micro learning session that's going to be focusing on discovering and mobilizing community assets. Uh, my name is Bo Ballou and I happen to be the director of the Purdue Center for Regional Development and also the assistant director of the Extension Community Development Program, also at Purdue. Uh, I'm very excited to have you uh, joining me to talk about this important topic uh, that we have been engaged in for some time in our work in community development, both in Indiana and beyond. The learning session is going to really be talking about four major topics and then I'll complete uh, conclude with some uh, comments about this whole uh, community asset approach. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about needs versus asset-based approaches. We'll talk then about uh, why does uh, deploying assets matter. Uh, then we're going to get into a little bit of discussion about what are some of the areas in which you can deploy or at least identify and then deploy assets. So we're looking at people, we'll look at voluntary associations and local institutions. And like I indicated at the very beginning, I'll then uh, conclude with a few comments uh, for you to consider as you do this kind of work in the communities in which you represent. I want to begin by also giving attribution to a couple of people who are instrumental in building this whole asset-based community development approach. Uh, that's John Kretzman and John McKnight, both from Northwestern University. In 1993, they published this uh, report or this document called Building Communities from the Inside Out. And uh, it has really changed the whole mindset about how we do uh, community development work. I encourage you to look up uh, this particular publication. My understanding that is now available uh, free for a download. Uh, so take advantage of this particular opportunity to, uh, to secure a free copy of this document. Again, very, very viable for people who are practitioners uh, in community development. So let me begin by the core of this discussion, at least this presentation, that is, what is needs assessment versus asset-based approaches? And I'd like to really identify some of the critical uh, elements that differ uh, between these two different approaches. Uh, you probably have uh, many times in your own work uh, uh, been asked to look at what are the needs that exist in your community or in your organization. So this is pretty much a needs assessment approach. And both Kretzman and McKnight indicate that one of the problems with the focus on needs assessment when it's done solely is that it tends to be a deficit-based approach, which means that I try to identify things we don't have. So uh, in many respects, they said it's needs-driven. What are the needs or problems that exist? Uh, it's, again, as I indicate, focus on just concerns or issues that exist. Uh, it's externally focused. And what we mean by that is a lot of times uh, when we're looking at problems that exist in our community, we're looking for some help from the, some external entity, be it a state agency, a federal government, a philanthropic organization. Uh, it's again, us seeking help from outside uh, for, uh, for tackling this issue. Uh, and uh, what is missing is that, is that, is that we must, is something that we must find. Uh, in other words, if we're lacking health care or if we're concerned about the quality of our education or lack of broadband, we always tend to think about what is missing, what can we do to fill that void. And uh, Kretzman and McKnight indicate that uh, this kind of deficit-based approach may sometimes lead to die, downward spiral or burnout, depression or dysfunction. In other words, people get so bombarded with what we, the problems we have, the negativity, the dysfunction, the deficit, that it really begins to pay, uh, pay a toll uh, on the mindset of people and organizations that exist in these communities. On the other hand, uh, uh, is this asset-based approach it really focuses on strengths. It's driven by strengths that we have in our community. It looks at not at what the problems are, but what are the opportunities uh, that we have. And when we say it's internally focused, we mean that it's really focusing at people and groups within the community uh, to be mobilized to help address these issues, not depend on the outside, but be driven within uh, the capabilities uh, in the community. Uh, we. Uh, we build on what we have it's that's focused on our present assets and it may oftentimes lead to unexpected and exciting responses to community goals so these are the two major uh, i guess the differences that exist between the asset-based versus the deficit-based approaches to community development i can't help but think about uh, a sign that uh, that we have about this, and I'll show you in a minute, but it's really quite interesting about how we can look at this. 
Uh, so the dilemma we often have, you know, you've heard, you've heard of the proverbial half empty, half full notion. If you take at this picture, uh, the notion of needs assessment says we are looking at deficiencies that we have in our community, whereas the asset-based approach says let's look at the skills and talents we have and let's take that half full uh, component and build on that. And that's really uh, the simply stated the differences that exist in these two approaches. So as I indicated, the signs see our community disabilities. And if you just get rid of the dish, it really means what are our abilities in our community? And this is really a positive way to look at uh, an approach uh, for addressing some of the important issues we have in our community. So why does it make sense or why should we even worry about uh, deploying assets? Why does it matter? To me, it's because it sets a whole new tone in your community. And so I wanna share with you some of the elements that are really critical. If you can embrace this approach, these are things that are really absolutely essential that you abide by. One is that any community, regardless of whether it's an urban community in Indiana, a rural community, a suburban community, uh, be it rich, be it poor, be it growing community or declining community than some of that we have in Indiana, the key is that regardless of these conditions, people and organizations, exist in these areas that have a number of assets. And that the ability, the vitality of any community, it depends on our capacity to uncover and tap these talents, these skills and these resources of both local residents and groups that exist in our community. And so it's important to take the time to, to, to discover and to define these assets and to improve the community's chances of achieving its important goals by connecting these assets uh, together. Very, very critical set of conditions that really are instrumental when it comes to community asset mapping. So what I want to do is, is, is share with you the three arenas that we tend to focus on when we start talking about uh, asset-based community development. One is people, the residents of our community. Second is the voluntary associations that exist that really make such a difference in the lifeblood of our community. And the third one is our local formal institutions. So what I'd like to do is kind of walk you through each of these very briefly so that you get a better sense of what we're talking about in terms of the assets within these three arenas. So let me first talk about people, the assets of individuals. Uh, it's important again, as we said earlier, to, to take the time to find people who can help, can help support your community improvement efforts. And these include three different kinds of people, if we can say that. One, people who have influence and power, who are the leaders who are in key positions uh, that have access to the kinds of resources that are needed to pursue and achieve important community goals. The second are those individuals who have been involved in a community, who are building knowledge and skills and who are, in essence, the emerging leaders. These are the people who have the seeds of leadership and with a little bit more nurturing could become the leadership of the future. And the third are those people who have talents and skills, but often either go unrecognized or underappreciated or untapped. And we know we have a number of people in our community who have those skills and talents who are simply never asked to step up and to try to help make a difference. So let me talk about each of these three different kinds of people. How about those who are, have influence and power? How do you find them? Well, one of the ways is to look at positional leaders and that's simply those people who occupy some of the top slots in our community, people in the private sector, uh, people in public organizations like local government leaders, superintendent of schools, uh, key business leaders, uh, 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 individuals who are in the healthcare sector. Again, I think you can identify people who are in key uh, positions within your community in these different various organizations, like the United Way. The second one uh, would be the reputational leaders. And these are, you can ask people who are uh, involved in the community, who has a reputation for power? Who is it that you think has a good amount of influence that could weigh in on some important issues uh, impacting our community. So that this is important. And in all my experiences doing community development, I have found that you cannot try to do anything important in the community without having connecting to those who are in positions of influence and power. It doesn't mean they're gonna be actively involved, but it means that they may have been made aware of this program or the initiative you're carrying out and have given their approval, at least 
a tacit approval uh, for you moving forward. Because again, if they don't agree with you, they can become a major barrier to anything uh, being done in the community. Emerging leaders uh, is, uh, you know, we've developed a community participation leadership inventory worksheet, which we'll have attached to this uh, micro learning session. Uh, if once you read, once you listen to it, uh, this is to how we can find people who are beginning to become involved in the community. So we've given you a little worksheet. It could be people who are having a leadership in some civic organizations or people who have become more involved in some local government activities. They're not in leadership positions yet, but you can tell they've got the kinds of uh, interests and the capabilities that we really believe will become uh, the leadership of the future. So uh, these, this is a, a more important group we want to identify as well. And the third one are residents who have had limited past involvement. Again, thinking about this asset-based community development approach, it's everyone in the community has some talent and skills, and strong communities are those that value these skills and tackling some local issues and challenges. And so again, take the time to tap the talents and skills of local people who really, if ever, get invited to help. And let me share with you an example of a worksheet that we have built that draws from the work of Kretzman and McKnight that I just referenced at the very beginning of this uh, presentation. We're, you can't read this very well, but just know that we've got a worksheet that talks about, do you have this skill? We ask people, do you have skills related to health, to office, uh, to computer related activities, to sales, to supervision, to machinery repair, to transportation? We have a whole host of different areas where we ask people, do you have this skill? And if not, is this something, a skill that you would like to learn? So we do two things at one time here. Not only we do we identify areas in which they really have uh, you know, talents that they want to share and hopefully contribute to the community, but they, they're also expressing things that they would like to get better at. And this could become a very good workforce development kind of activity or, or leadership development activity uh, for our communities. So this is a worksheet that I would recommend you try to look at urge you to adapt it to your local needs. But the key is how can we get people to tell us this is things I am good at and I'd be willing to make available to me to help uh, in the community. So the, uh, the next one is voluntary association in the local institution. So let me walk you through each of these and give you again uh, ways that you can better delineate what they can bring to the table. Voluntary groups are just really community-minded organizations that exist in the community, and, and uh, these are certain attributes that relate to voluntary groups. One, they rely pretty much on volunteers. They may have paid staff in some cases. They may not. They are typically guided by some type of advisory committee or board made up of community residents, community volunteers. Uh, they tend to be not-for-profit organizations. And they typically involve in providing benefits and services to people in their community. Some examples are your civic minded organizations like JCs and Rotary. Uh, you have sports leagues who are engaged in helping provide positive uh, activities for kids. You have faith based uh, organizations, youth groups, business associations, and more. Just think about any of these voluntary groups who are really doing things that benefit the community both directly and indirectly. Then the other one is what we call local institutions. And these are the formal entities that exist in your hometown. And in different communities, we have some of these uh, institutions that are very strong and some of that may be not quite so strong because they may not be large enough to, to have all these institutions yeah, uh, present, at least in, in a very significant way. These institutions, those are, though, are the ones that carry out some pretty vital uh, activities that preserve the long-term growth and stability of your community. So think about this way, it's family, it's the economic sector, it's the educational institutions, it's the government entities, the healthcare sector, and faith-based institutions. These from the literature have all been identified as institutions that are instrumental in helping carry out important community functions. You can imagine how some communities may be very, very strong economically because they may be a vibrant, uh, center of uh, economic activity. And you may have other areas of Indiana, for example, that are more rural and their economy is not as diverse, not as robust, 
And as a consequence, some of the people who live in that community have to go uh, to jobs located in the more metropolitan areas. So you can see that these institutional uh, assets are, not, are different uh, in, in communities in terms of their strength. So this is really important to think about in terms of these, uh, of these assets. So what we've done then is we built an inventory that helps you identify what do these voluntary and local institutions bring to the table that we as a community might want to tap to really, again, to tackle and to address some important opportunities in our community. So this voluntary and formal institutional inventory looks at a number of different things. One, what is the mission and purpose of that organization? So if you go to, uh, if you go to a particular uh, civic organization, uh, like the Rotary, that, like the JCs, you find out, okay, what's your mission? What is your purpose? What, why do you exist? Do you have a physical location? Some of these organizations will not. They may be meeting at a particular, uh, at a particular community center or in a uh, hotel uh, that, has, uh, that hosts these different organizations. Uh, so they may have, but they may have a physical location. Uh, how many members or employees do they have? And we want to know this because these, these are in essence resources that this organization or institution makes, could make available to support community improvement activities. Uh, what are their current and planned activities or programs? Uh, what are the, if it's a civic organization or social service club or whatever, what are they doing that is maybe of benefit or aligns with some important opportunities in the community or issues in the community? And what are they planning for the future? And this is really quite interesting because you find out that some of the planned activities are not necessarily the same as their current activities, but they may have aspirations of things that they would like to do uh, in the future as an organization. What organizations do they partner with? Again, if we go to a civic club and to find out that they have 15 other groups they work with, they become a, a network, they become an asset that we have available to connect to, connect to a number of other groups uh, without a whole lot of uh, you know, work to, on our part in terms of having to reach all those other 14 or 15 organizations. Then finally, what resources do they have? Do they have buildings that can be used perhaps for meetings that we want to have? Do they have specific equipment like computer equipment, like the ability to provide uh, training uh, to individuals or adults that we want to provide workforce development training to? What expertise do they have that can be tapped uh, for the kind of work we're doing? They may be engineers, they may be in the healthcare sector, uh, they may be teachers, uh, they may be carpenters, they may be manufacturers, they all have expertise that can be tapped uh, given whatever issue or, or uh, opportunity you're exploring. And do they award grants and donations? Do they have grants that they make available to local groups? And do they have connections to external resources? And I think about Target, for example, or Walmart, Walmart Foundation. Uh, Target has a foundation that's designed to help support community uh, uh, improvement activities, and these are resources that are external to your community. The main office may be the, uh, may be the entity that coordinates that, that uh, particular program. So again, these are connections you can make if you take the time to identify the kinds of resources uh, these organizations and, uh, and may have that you could uh, tap for your activities. So one thing we always talk about is that these assets are great, but they don't make much sense or make much value unless you activate them, you connect them, and you connect them to different entities. So it's important we talk about synergy. We want to link people, voluntary groups and community institutions together to address each community goal. I have, in my, in my experience, been able to help communities realize that there are people who care about X topic there are voluntary groups who also care about that topic and some major local institutions, and they're all doing it uh, uh, separate from one, one another. So what we're talking about is how, just think of the synergy that could exist when you bring these three entities together to collectively focus on some of these community challenges, community opportunities, these community goals. And that's what we're talking about is connecting. You gotta take the time to link these assets together. So, and in, in when you do so, you bring to the table a diversity of perspectives on the efforts and for the, furthermore, it really helps create uh, solutions and strategies, innovative solutions and strategies to some of these issues. And furthermore, it builds a broad base of support and commitment 
uh, to the kind of local goal, goals that you are trying to uh, implement. So one, one thing you could do, for example, is have this simple worksheet. If you have to be technology savvy, you could do this as a spreadsheet or, or other uh, uh, computer-based uh, uh, you know, program you may have. But let's say, for example, you have a community goal, left, left column, you'll see the top of, uh, of this table. You have a community goal here. You list that community goal. Then you begin the inventory. Okay, who are the people we have who have resources, capabilities, knowledge, skills that could relate? Do we have voluntary organizations? And what are some of the community institutions uh, that exist in our community that would have an interest in this particular topic? So that's what we're talking about is building this simple inventory of these people, organizations, and associations, uh, and, and, and bringing them together uh, in support of specific goals that you're trying to, uh, to implement. So my concluding comments is that this is not easy work. Doing asset-based community development, looking at uh, this notion of uh, discovering and mobilizing community assets, uh, is a process that takes time, uh, but the benefits are far outweigh the time it will take you uh, to carry out this activity. So I urge all of you who are thinking about tackling community issues to take this asset-based community development approach, say whatever the issues are we have in our community, let's begin by first discovering the kinds of assets we have that can be brought to the table, that can be mobilized in helping address these issues. And I think in the end, you're gonna find out that you will successfully carry out some of the important work that you want to achieve in your community. So with that said, my, again, my name is Bo Ballou and I'm the director of the Purdue Center for Regional Development and assistant director of the Extension Community Development Program at Purdue University. Please feel free to contact our office at any time. The number is there, 765-494-7273. Or feel free to email me at ljb at purdue.edu. We welcome your comments. We welcome your uh, interest. And we'll be glad to further elaborate on anything related to this topic, if you so wish. With that said, have a good day. And thank you for joining this, this uh, uh, micro-learning session.